Uh, well, uh, Christine, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by thanking Diane and all the staff at uh, Chatham House for uh, organising today's event. Uh, let me particularly welcome the new Managing Director of the IMF uh, to London uh, on her first official uh, occasion on the European continent since her appointment. Uh, I first knew her, of course, as a formidable Minister of Finance for France. I can confirm that she is a very good negotiator for her country. Uh, and uh, France's loss is the world's gain, and she is already making her presence felt at the fund. And Christine, thank you for coming to London. Uh, she has taken over, of course, the IMF at a crucial time for the global economy. And we are less than eight hours away now from the start of the first of the international meetings of the autumn. Uh, and later this morning, we'll be traveling to the G7 summit in Marseille to join our fellow finance ministers, representatives of international institutions, central bank governors uh, from the world's major uh, Western economies. Those meetings need to produce a coordinated plan of action that helps us navigate through the economic turbulence we are all experiencing. And I think Christine has just set out an extremely clear agenda to achieve precisely that. As she just said, global activity has slowed, downside risks have increased, and the global rebalancing of demand growth has stalled. The challenges we face are more complex than we faced at the beginning of this crisis. But the underlying cause is the same, excessive levels of debt. A debt crisis in the banking sector has now turned into a wider crisis of sovereign banking and private sector debt. Then we faced a relatively straightforward battle against the forces of deflation and instability. Now we must contend with competing pressures market pressures on indebted sovereigns, continued banking instability, a crisis in the Eurozone, and continuing imbalances in global demand. And just as the problems are different, so must be the international response. Uh, as Christine has said, each country's response needs to be differentiated. To repeat the sporting analogy I used on Tuesday, in 2008, the world had to act like a tug-of-war team, all pulling in the same direction. <coughs> Today, we need to be like a football team, with everyone's role suited to their positions and abilities, if that team is to be successful. The agenda for coordinated global action should be clear. Indeed, I agree with Tim Geithner's prognosis that the three most important things are more forceful action in Europe, getting the US economy moving, and rebalancing global demand towards surplus countries. Now first, to state the obvious, a debt crisis must be confronted by tackling the debt. Those countries with large budget deficits and significant fiscal vulnerabilities, including the United Kingdom, with one of the largest budget deficits of all, must continue to set out and implement credible deficit reduction plans that will get debt as a percentage of GDP onto a declining path. As the managing director says, the United Kingdom's strong fiscal consolidation is essential to restore debt sustainability given the UK's very high structural budget deficit and large financial sector relative to GDP. That's why, Christine Lagarde says, our policy stance remains appropriate. And I agree with her that policymakers must remain alert to risks, and that's why the automatic stabilizers and the ability of monetary policy to respond are key parts of the flexibility built into our plan. Britain will stick to the deficit plan we have set out. It is the rock of stability upon which our recovery is built, and it's delivered record low interest rates. Abandoning that plan would put those interest rates at risk, and nothing would be more damaging for Britain at this fragile moment for the world's economy than an increase in mortgage rates for families and an increase in the cost of borrowing for businesses. It's crucial to remember that simply announcing deficit reduction plans is not enough. They need to be implemented too. And of course, in order to be credible, plans must be rooted with incredible fiscal frameworks. In the Eurozone, that means member countries should follow the remorseless logic of monetary union and make more progress on institutional reform and fiscal integration. While at all times, we will make sure the UK is not part of that fiscal integration and that our interests are protected and promoted. The second element of the global response is to accompany credible fiscal consolidation with credible action to strengthen banking systems. 
If banking systems are allowed to remain impaired and fragile, then not only will financial instability persist, but the monetary transmission mechanism will remain broken, denying businesses and families the full benefits of low interest rates that are so crucial for recovery. And here, too, each country's response should be differentiated. As Tim Geithner said in the Financial Times today, countries that forced more capital into their banking systems early in the crisis are better placed to support the recovery. Those that did not should move more forcibly now. I think the IMF has a huge role to play in making sure this agenda is taken forward, for example, with their financial sector assessment programs, which are now compulsory for systemic countries. So dealing with the fundamental causes of this crisis, is ex excessive debt, is critical. Unless we do that, we will simply make the problem worse. At the same time, however, we need a global rebalancing of demand. And that's the third part of the international response. We're all familiar by now with what that means. Current account surplus countries should do more to rebalance their economies and encourage domestic sources of demand. I spent virtually the whole of yesterday with my Chinese counterpart, Vice Premier Wang Shishan, and he was at pains to explain how China is boosting domestic demand through its 12th five-year plan. While this global rebalancing is underway, different countries should take different paths to support demand. For example, and I said this on Tuesday, the US, with its reserve currency, faces different constraints from other countries, allowing the US the flexibility to take the actions proposed by President Obama yesterday. For countries with high deficits who lack the security of the global reserve currency and are more exposed to a loss of market confidence, the best way to support demand is to show they can live within their means, help keep their interest rates low and monetary conditions supportive of growth. And that is precisely what the Managing Director of the IMF has just explained. Again, I think the IMF has a central role in this. With this year's annual Article 4 Economic Assessments of the Key Economies, They've also produced, for the first time, what is known as a spillover report. And this new analysis is exclusive to the countries whose economies have been identified as systemically important to the world. The United States, the Eurozone, China, Japan, and the UK. They look at the relationship between individual countries' domestic policies and the wider stability of the global economy. They are an important innovation in macroeconomic surveillance and complement the other work the Fund has been doing to advise the G20 finance ministers on how to deliver strong, sustainable and balanced growth. The final element of the global agenda must be a concerted effort to open up markets and reform our economies to make them more productive. In particular, at a global level, there could be no greater stimulus than renewed progress on global trade talks. And we urgently need a real push towards improving the functioning and transparency of oil markets, increasing supply and bringing, bringing oil prices down from their current elevated level. This is the right international agenda for the world economy. I support it. The IMF has advocated it. It should form the basis for our international discussions later today and for all the international meetings that are to come later this autumn. The world needs political leadership. And with this agenda, we have a chance of delivering just that. Thank you very much.